So anyway, just a little commercial about our um, college where I work. It's um, in Oceanside, and in 2007 we built a um, new building that's dedicated just to horticulture. And we have 10 acres with greenhouses and an orchard, a vineyard, and all kinds of really um, cool plantings around it that demonstrate really good um, landscapes. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, we have certificates of achievement, as we call it, in landscape architecture, landscape management, nursery crop production, and all of those can be um, combined with general education classes if you're interested in getting an associate degree. And so our students that are going there are either employed in the industry or they're interested in advancing on their job and maybe transferring to a four-year college. So it's all kinds, and, and people are really just interested in learning more about their own landscapes. Um, so a couple of the smaller certificates we have are in irrigation technology and wine technology, which is very popular. Um, some of the classes that we have are listed here. So we do anything, you know, again, from the wines of California to plant ID, subtropical fruit, etc. I'm going to have to figure out how to get this to quit advancing. Okay, well let's get started on our soils topic. Um, I kind of laughed when... She said, oh, we're not trying to overburden you with too much information, but <laughs> there's a lot in here. So um, anyway, just kind of to set the stage, it's really important to be successful. You have to know the nature of the soil, and it really is, as, as Julie mentioned, the foundation of everything. Be it deep or shallow, red or black, sand or clay, the soil is the link between the rock core of the earth and the living things on its surface. It's the foothold for the plants that we grow. So it's really important that we understand from the bottom up what's going on. And sometimes that just unlocks a lot of um, clues about the world around us. So we're going to study that today as much as possible. We're going to take a look at how soils form so we have an understanding of where they come from. We're going to look especially at the physical properties, which you guys have done when you brought your sample and we'll be looking at those and trying to determine some physical things about it, the color, the texture, the structure maybe. We'll talk about soil chemical properties and a little bit later on we're going to do a pH test that will kind of key into that. How to manage soils, especially soils and water, which is really critical and important. And then we'll get a little bit into fertilizers and then the test results that you came up with on your own soils and how to interpret those and then maybe what to do about some of the problems that you might run into on soils. So again, we think of soils as sort of that part of the Earth's surface or crust that is the life-supporting layer of material. So it's not the rock, it's not the pavement, it's the stuff that actually supports life. And if you look at sort of an in-depth view of the Earth here, you can see there's the atmosphere, there's the soil, and there's the crust the core, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very thin layer. It's just that little black line. Let's see if I can get you right there. So it's very thin, very fragile. And in some cases, it can be 100 feet deep, but in other areas, it maybe is only just a few inches deep, depending on where you're located. Now, the soil, as we probably all read and know, does a lot of vital things for the earth. It sustains the plant and animal life. And one interesting thing is there's actually more going on in the soil than there is above the soil. If you count the organisms, especially in the types and variety down there, there's a tremendous amount of life, or should be, hopefully, um, going on in that soil below. Um, it also is something that helps regulate water, which is really important. Um, it is, when we have rain, <laughs> if we do, it's going to help control how quickly that leaves the surface and runs off or perhaps penetrates. So the quality of our soil is going to really make a big um, impact on that. It also does help to filter and buffer and detoxify things. We can actually use certain types of soils as toxic waste dumps because it really is a good holder of certain types of toxic chemicals and keeps it from running off into things. Now sand would be a terrible toxic waste dump, but clay would be ideal for that. So we know about soils and their nature, their properties, we can really use them to our advantage. It, we use it a lot for storing nutrients and make them available, hopefully eventually, for plant growth. And all the roads, all the houses, the buildings that we you know, occupy all depend on the soil. So it has engineering qualities as well. 
Okay, so again, there's living systems occurring above the ground and below the ground. And just kind of some uh, examples of some of the insects and animals that live down there. These are sort of a macro fauna, but there's also lots of microbes and other organisms that live there, which are really important. And they do a lot of really good things for us, so we want to encourage those as much as possible. So again, we don't see it often, but we definitely cannot ignore it. Um, we've learned some lessons back in the 30s and 40s during the Dust Bowl. We had really prolonged drought, kind of like we're having now, which is kind of scary. But back then, we did not take care of the soil. We would just sort of abandon it, we would maybe overuse it, we wouldn't um, build it back up. And as a result, in that period of drought and the dust storms that came afterwards, the soil surface was not protected and it actually picked up and took the soil to the point where they actually said if you were on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, you actually could see some of the dust settling out from the central part of the United States. So it was an incredible situation. I believe the red zone in oops, sorry about that. The red zone in here is where it actually occurred, but the other areas are where the effects were felt immediately, and so many people were displaced at that time. We have since learned from that. We formed the Soil Conservation Service, which is now the um, National Resource Conservation Service, and so their job basically is to help landowners preserve and take care of the soil in do things um, to enhance it so that we don't lose it. And we've got all kinds of problems with water and soil, flooding, etc. can cause problems, but um, the de desertification is where you basically get soil to a point where it's not capable of supporting life anymore. So those are some things that we want to try to avoid. Now, soil is the medium basically for plant growth. It's not the only medium. But it does provide four major things for plants. It holds it up, so that's the anchorage part of it, allows the roots to grow through it. It also is a source of moisture for the plants, the plant roots are in there. Oxygen, which a lot of people forget about, but the roots do have to carry on respiration and breathe. And then of course it's a storage house of nutrients, and those are absorbed by the roots and brought up to the plant. Um, the pictures that I have here are kind of interesting. I just found those on the internet. This was billed as being transparent soil that um, scientists have come up with to grow plants in. And apparently, this substance, which has a fancy name I already forgot, but it's a, a polymer of sorts that actually provides all those four things for plants. And if you're familiar with hydroponics, we also try to mimic all these four things that soil does naturally for the plants in using water systems, maybe with gravel or perhaps some other little thing to give it the support that it needs. But we'll feed oxygen through it, we'll feed nutrients, and of course the moisture and the water that the plants need. Um, when we're looking at soil, we think of it as a, a three-phase system. In other words, it's just sort of um, talking about the three <laughs> basic parts what we refer to as the solid phase, which makes up about half of the soil, if you count 45% of it being mineral and 5% being organic matter. That's a typical ideal soil. And then we've got a liquid phase, which makes up half of the other half, or 25%. And then we have the gas phase, or the part of it that is what we refer to as the open space, the voids of the soil. And that's where the air, the oxygen, etc., is located in the soil. So it's half solid, a quarter liquid, and a quarter of open space in an ideal condition. Now, sometimes if we've had a flood for a while, those open spaces, the gas might be displaced and it's just filled with water temporarily. But when it gets back to equilibrium and you know things are in their ideal condition, this would be pretty much what it looks like. And again, that organic matter can vary depending on what part of the United States you're in. In the West, maybe it's only 2 to 3% naturally occurring. In the East Coast, it might be up more like 7%. So it kind of averages at 5%. But again, this is sort of, again, the ideal picture of what soil might look like. Now, plant growth occurs in there, especially the roots. And as the root hairs come out, 
Um, they will go through the soil. Um, they will absorb oxygen and they'll absorb water through that. So it's important that we do have those pore spaces in between the individual soil particles. Now let's take a look at soil formation. How did they get to be the way they are? Why are soils in you know, one neighborhood totally different from another neighborhood? Why are soils here in California different from Alaska or Pennsylvania? Um, they can all be totally different because of these five factors that work together. And we refer to those as topography, climate, the actual parent material that it's derived from, time, and then the effect of plants and animals or organisms on it. So these are the five factors that work together to form soil. And soil formation can take a long time. I mean, it can take hundreds if not thousands of years, depending on the type of parent material and all these other forces that act on it over time. So time is an important factor. It's a renewable resource, kind of, but a very long-term one. So when we destroy soil or strip it off and move it away, it's not going to come back in you know, three months or six years. It's going to be hundreds of years before new soil forms that's any decent you know, ability to support plant material or plant growth. Now, this you probably cannot read, um, but this is um, just giving a listing of the um, rocks and minerals that might be made up of parent material. And so we've got a few of them that we're listing up here, quartz and feldspar and then calcite or dolomite. And so if you're looking at a granitic type of soil, it might be like 64% quartz, 20% feldspar, 7% calcium or dolomite. And then when you actually look at how many pounds there are per ton of rock, it might be 69 pounds of calcium in a ton, 66 of potassium, magnesium, iron, phosphorus, and then little to no manganese. So if your parent material is granite, you know, it's not too bad. If it's basalt, which is another type of <coughs> mineral, Again, you have a lot more calcium. You've got 150 pounds. Not so much, excuse me, of calcium, not so much potassium. A lot more magnesium, a little bit more iron. You've got the same amount of phosphorus and some manganese. But hey, if your parent material was actually sandstone, like a lot of us have maybe near the coastal areas, mostly made up of quartz, the nutrient level is really bad. You've got some iron, and that's about it. So if you're growing on this type of soil, if that's your parent material, it's not a very rich soil. It all depends on what it, the basic kind of rock that broke down to form the soil is from. So if you're in East County, if you're you know, up north, down south, coastal, etc., your parent materials can vary, and therefore the innate, innate sort of nature or nutrition of your soil also varies. Now, parent material can either be formed in place or it can be transported. And this can be um, depending on, again, geographically where you're located. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, so we were under the influence of glaciers. We had three ice ages um, that came down, and as they came down and then retreated over the hundreds of thousands of years, um, that made an effect on our soils. If you're in an area that is a lot of wind, you'll end up having what are referred to as low S type soils or maybe sand dunes um, taking place and forming. Um, if you're in a floodplain or near a river or perhaps near the ocean, you're going to get a lot of sediments from that. So like in the Imperial Valley, there's a lot of marine sediments and some things going on from maybe some rivers that were there. They could be ancient, no longer existing, um, or at one point, you know, that might have been sort of a coastal area and then the oceans receded. So that can affect what's laid down there um, as the basic parent material. Um, depending on where you're located, top of the slope, bottom in the valley, the force of gravity can also have an influence on the development of the soil. And so when you say soil, even in one neighborhood in San Diego County, there's hundreds of types of soil, all depending on how the parent material got there or if it formed in place. 
Now climate and especially temperature have an effect on some of the processes that go in breaking down these rocks and minerals. So chemical reactions are controlled by temperature. Um, the plants growing there, if this was you know, in a very cold climate, not much plant growth, not much biotic activity breaking those soils down. And so temperature is really going to influence then how quickly your soils form. So we would expect tropical soils maybe to form faster than those from Arctic areas. Uh, the amount of moisture, rainfall, and wind is going to have some effect as well. So if you don't have weather, um, and you don't have rainfall, like sometimes we have that issue, then again, chemical processes are going to slow down, the organisms are not going to be real happy in dry areas, and so our soil formation is not going to be very significant from those influences. If you have a lot of wind, then you could have some erosion and that um, transportation. So organisms actively do affect soil formation, and it could be the plants, it could be animals, it could be insects, and more often than not, it's the microbes that are helping to do soil formation. So all of these sort of biotic ingredients here help to form soils. Now as we talked about topography, if you're up high, down low, in the middle of a slope, um, if it's uh, exposed on the north side of the slope, the south side, facing the wind, etc., all of these things can have a hand in that. And then all of those put together with the factor of time is what makes a particular type of soil. So I just wanted to give you a little snapshot of how, how all of that works together. The other thing to think about too is that soil is not just sort of one dimensional. It's very much three dimensional. You've got distance, you've got depth, um, and one of the things that's happening with that is over time, especially as the plants and animals and the, the water percolating through there, will begin to form what we refer to as layers or horizons. So if you don't have a lot of significant moisture or plants and animals living in that upper surface there, you may not have very good soil development. You may have just very simple, maybe some topsoil over bedrock. Um, over here we've got a more developed profile where we have a layer of organic matter that's known as the O-horizon. The A horizon we typically call the topsoil. The B horizon is the subsoil. And then the C horizon is what we refer to as the bedrock. Most of the plant roots are going to be growing in that A horizon because that's where the best moisture, maybe the best aeration is. And then as you get down into the B horizon, there may be some toxic chemicals in there. There may be more compaction. It may not have as good of uh, you know, organic matter, the nutrition could be different, the pH could even be different down at these deeper depths. Um, one interesting thing though, if you, you know, move into an area that's been developed, oftentimes the developers will come in and scrape off the topsoil, they will grade that subsoil, pound it down really mm -hmm. tightly and compact it so they can put in the sidewalks and the roads and the, the foundations for the homes, that's really important but you're left with a yard that is sadly lacking. And you can get topsoil, but you're going to probably have to pay to get it brought back. Now, one nice thing though, I've heard recently there's legislation in California that is requiring the developers now to stockpile the topsoil and bring it back. So that's kind of really cool. Um, I'm glad somebody thought about that, but for decades it was just like shipped off, sold, you were lucky if you were able to, you know, grow sod and then maybe over time could develop a decent garden, but you almost always had to bring in something to, you know, build that soil back up. So that's really nice to know that that's um, happening. Okay, um, I have a little video clip here. I want to see if we can play this. I'm not sure how it's going to work. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a little a taste of what we're talking about with soil formation and all those ingredients. So I'm going to get back here to my... Okay, so 
Okay, so the next thing we're going to take a look at is the soil physical properties. And these are known as texture, structure, and color. And the physical properties are really key into understanding how soils are used to grow plants and then also those engineering purposes. So now that we've kind of seen them form, know and understand that they're different all over the place, unfortunately, and in San Diego County we have a lot of everything here. We're one of those biological hot spots and we also have a lot of different types of soil. So that's kind of interesting but can be very challenging. So let's take a look at soil color. And you may even want to take a look at your own soil samples that you've brought in here briefly. Maybe glance over to your neighbor. And I can tell just by your jar um, things sitting out that some of you have very dark soil. Some of you have kind of very light colored and maybe some even sort of orangey in color. And I'm assuming you come from all over the place and so we will have a variety of soils in here today because of that. Soil color can tell us some things about the soil. They can tell us maybe what nutrients they were made of. If you remember, we talked about the sand being high in iron oxides. And so if you do have that, then you will probably have a reddish, orangish, or maybe even yellowish color to your soil. Probably all you know heard of red Georgia clay, maybe even seen it. Um, traveled out east and that is very high in iron oxides and so it stains the soil that color. If you've been to Hawaii or you've been to you know, other parts of the east coast, maybe even brought home a, a shirt that was dyed, you know, <laughs> kind of orange or brown because of the soil um, things in there. So that can indicate what nutrient maybe was a big part of that. Um, those of you that have very dark colored soils, and especially if you have a lot of stuff floating at the top of your water in the jar, all of that that floats at the top is organic matter. Okay? And that generally gives a very dark color to your soil, and it may even stain the water a dark color. Some of you might have clear water, and you know, again, it may not be stained that tea color, but maybe it's because you don't have a lot of organic matter. It's hard to say. Um, if you have a very gray soil or a light colored soil, sometimes that means you had poor drainage. And we have this, we do this jar, jar experiment at school all the time. We let them sit on a shelf sometimes for years. And we come back and we look and they've all turned gray. So if soil has been underwater for a long time, it actually is gray in color. And you may have, um, you know, dug foundations for ponds or maybe bought bentonite clay to put in there and notice that it's kind of that gray color that helps seal a pond. Well, that's normal and natural, but if you do have soils of, that are that color, get suspicious, especially if they are wet and stinky, then you know that maybe you have a high water table, you're overwatering, or it's been underwater for a long period of time. So poor drainage usually is a gray color. Now, there is a system, it's been developed, it's sort of like the color chips and charts for soil. It's called the Munsell system of color notation. And a soil scientist would use this then to go out and classify soil. Oops, let's see. There we go. Um, so soil color, again, is indicative of that nutrient composition. You can see the soil scientist there with his little color chart. And this guy is actually, um, kind of interestingly enough, he is trying to evaluate a soil to see if it maybe is a wetland. Because wetlands are now protected, and so he's figured out a way to actually take a soil in a lab, put it under like a camera, and actually analyze it that way. Sort of like if you go to the paint store and you bring a color of something in, they can analyze it and make paint for you. They can analyze the colors of soil as well in the laboratory. Um, oftentimes they just bring a paper chart though out to do com color comparisons in the field, but they can also do this electronically now. And so it's very important to help them classify and categorize soils according to color. Another thing that we'll be taking a look at is texture. And that's kind of the main point of your jar that you have with the liquid in it and the settling that you did in there because we found out that soil separates into three basic sizes of particles. The very smallest of them is the clay-sized particles. 
the very large particles are referred to as sand, and sort of in the middle, the medium-sized particles are referred to as silt. And so if you look at this representation here, the large circles here are the sand-sized particles. This is considered to be very coarse sand here in the outer part. And then we've got sort of medium sand and then fine sand. This little circle in here um, is very fine sand. Then we've got silt and probably just a little dot is the actual clay. So if you're comparing a clay particle size to a sand particle size, there's a vast difference. They're hugely different in size. And because of those sizes, they're going to cause different properties in the soil. And so again, just kind of looking at it from left to right, the various, this is actually gravel, then there's sand, silt, and clay. And what it does is it affects the surface area of the soil, and that's where the nutritional activity, the chemical activity takes place. It's also where uh, the water holding capacity takes place. So if you can imagine, the greater the surface area, the greater all those water holding capacity is, and also nutrient holding capacity. Which type of soil, a clay soil or a sandy soil, do you think has the most surface area? The clay. The clay. Very good. Done your homework. <laughs> Smaller particles, actually, each one of those particles adds up to have a much larger surface area in total and sand has the smallest amount of surface area. <clears throat> now again, we just use these three broad classes, the sand, the silt, and the clay. And the sand is the heaviest and the largest. That should have settled to the bottom of your jar the first, so that's your first layer down at the bottom. The clay is the lightest one, the smallest, and many times it actually stays suspended in your water for a long time. So if your water is still cloudy, it could be because you've got clay particles still hanging suspended in there. The silt is usually your medium middle layer, if it was behaving. And there are actual sizes. Somebody actually got down with a micrometer and measured these and then made a comparison. The very coarse sand, if you could think of that as being 36 inches in diameter, so that's like a huge exercise ball. And then the clay being 1 32nd of an inch in diameter. Again, that's relatively speaking between. So again, something just a little speck versus a giant ball is the difference between those particle sizes. And so, as you can imagine, that makes a really vast difference in how things work. There, I know. Maybe not the most gorgeous thing to look at, but you do get the picture, I hope, that they're all mixed up. And what you did in your jar experiment there was you added something to it, hopefully. You shook it up, you broke it apart, and you got it down to its individual particle sizes. So we got them to separate and did an experiment that is based on the fact that a certain size object falls with a certain speed. So anything that fell within the first 40 seconds is considered to be a sand sized particle. So if you did this with a stopwatch, you could actually maybe, if it's not too murky, see that, take a measurement after 40 seconds, and that would be your sand layer. It takes 30 minutes for silt sized particles to fall. And so if you did another reading at 30 minutes, you might be able to see then that layer developing. But depending on the type of clay, sometimes that masks it and messes up your results. Um, but clay can take anywhere from 24 hours to three weeks, I think, <laughs> to settle out completely. And so that's going to take the longest. And it may still, as I mentioned, be still suspended in your soil. I see a real murky one there. Um, maybe you didn't. How long has that been trying to settle? Well, like, unfortunately, a few Did it fall? No, you. Yeah. It, it got a little shook up this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. So it's practically starting over again. Yeah, exactly. so, yeah. 
So, but you can see she's got stuff that hasn't fallen yet. So that's all her clay that's remaining suspended, and we'll just have to wait. Hopefully, she got some markings on there before that actually happened. But um, so what you do then is you take that information and you do some calculations. Everybody get a chance to mm -hmm. yep. fill theirs out and come up with percentages. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you can plot that on the soil texture triangle. Does anybody have their percentages ready that we could use as an example? Sure, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so what is your percentage of sand? 16.5. Yeah, okay, 16 is good enough. <laughs> okay, so here's 10 and 20, and we're down here on the sand axis. And starting at zero, so it's somewhere between 10 and 20. There's a little mark here, so it's just to the left of the 15 mark. Okay, what was your silt? Um, 49.5. Lots. Okay. Nice. So almost 50. And what was your clay? 33. Okay. I should say though, I could not dig my hole deeper than six inches. Okay. <laughs> hey, well, you know. I'm not very good with a shovel. Okay. So you read the clay number across this direction, and it should all add up to a hundred and should meet at a particular spot on the soil texture triangle. So we could say that her nice. particular soil is silty clay loam. And that's actually a really nice sweet spot to be in. Okay, that's sort of what we would refer to as medium texture. It's not so bad. Okay. Is there anybody that had kind of worse soil? <laughs> okay. You want to give me your numbers? I had 70% sand. Oh, okay. 30% silts and no clay. Wow, really? And Where are you located? Scripps Ranch. Where? Scripps Ranch. Scripps Ranch. And okay. I've got probably a third of the volume is rock. Ah. And what I found out this morning was, I, I brought the rock in, but it was so interesting to see all the rocks were in the hole. It's slimy. Now, would that be the clay that's attached to the rocks? Probably. And, and you brought some of your soil with you, too. We'll confirm that with what we call the ribbon test here a little bit later. Um, I think that's going to be after lunch. But you'll be able to um, actually feel it and see if you feel any clay. Because sometimes it... These particular um, things, you might find out that you really have sand and clay and no silt. And that would throw things off. So if it's sticky when you wet your soil and you can ribbon it, if it is, then then that would say that that's really probably clay rather than silt. I know it's a different part of the program here, but uh -huh. I had a, a ten and a half inch hole, eight inches wide. It drained in an hour, three oh. consecutive hours. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so that's well drained. Yeah. Maybe it was even 45 minutes. I, I went out okay. an hour and checked it. So. Okay. Yep. So. Now I know what problems are. Yeah. So you might have that sandy loam. And usually when we talk about these um, these names, one interesting thing is that it's still considered a loam, but sandy is sort of the the descriptor. It's a sandy loam. Okay. So you're again still kind of in that medium, but you're really down in the the well-drained kind of sandy large texture. How about anybody else in the um, the other direction? Heavy clay. Anybody have a lot of clay in their soil? Yeah. What? Okay. What are your numbers? So my numbers are um, for it was 20, 20, and 60. Okay, so 20 sand and 20 silt coming down this direction. 60 silt or 60 clay. Oh, 60 silt. Oops. You gave them to me in a little different number. Well, okay, if it had been this, 20, 20, 60, then it would be up in the clay. But she's saying it's something a little different. Um, she is saying that it's 20, 60, 20. 
So let's see what that does. Okay, so this is coming again in the loam area, but it's kind of the opposite of sandy loam, it's clay loam. Again, it's not, not too bad. Okay, so you've got a pretty decent texture. Okay. All right. So anybody that, that ends up here in the clay, you've got some problems. If you end up over here in the sandy area, you've got some problems you need to work with. But if you're kind of in that middle area here, or you've got the word loam associated with it, that's not too bad. Okay. You're kind of in the middle, and that's really not a bad place to be. So again, the sand particles are the largest. This is their size, 0.05 to 2 millimeters in diameter, in case anybody's counting. And then the spaces, as we mentioned, are very large and allow for good drainage and aeration of the soil. The silt is a medium size, 0.002 to 0.05 millimeters. And you can actually measure them with a sieve. They actually have screens you can physically screen them through to measure them. Um, that's one way to do it, or you can do it with this wet method too. And then, again, it's the medium size ones portrayed by the red beads, and so you've got the transitionary pores between macro and micro as kind of medio pores. The clay is the smallest of the soil separates, very tiny sheet-like crystals sometimes, and the pores are very small. They're very easy to hold moisture, and we refer to these as the micropores. So they prefer to hold water over air. Now, particle size matters because of surface area, which affects water holding, nutrient holding, aeration. And the smaller the particle, the more the surface area. And again, as we mentioned, most soils have more than just sand or just clay. They typically have a combination of the three particles. And you can actually classify them as fine, medium, or coarse. So sometimes when you're looking on a fertilizer bag or um, if you've got some uh, soil amending to do and it asks you, is your soil coarse, medium, or fine? When they say coarse, it's those sandy ones. When it says medium, it's the loamy soils. And when it says fine textured, it really means those clay soils. So whether you're doing the irrigation, water scheduling, calculators, it's going to ask you your soil texture. If you're trying to amend the soil with sulfur or um, gypsum or anything else, it's going to ask you what your texture is. If you're trying to put an herbicide down, um, it will also ask you what your soil texture is because it also affects all those chemical operations just, again, based on surface area. So those three ballparks are really important to know. <laughs> and again, you did your jar test, and as we mentioned, well, this says one minute, but usually we consider it about 40 seconds, 30 minutes, and then forever and ever <laughs> until the clay settles out sometimes. And again, it's showing you there in sort of a diagram, and then in reality what that might look like. Um, excuse me. Visually, between silt and sand, mm -hmm. it's hard. Yeah. And I'm wondering in my own jar, is there anything yeah. you could look for to know? If well, we're... you'll see here the particle size kind of dramatically shifts. Again, if you were able to sort of watch it and see it at that 30 minute mark, okay. or 40 second mark and measure, and then again at 30 minutes, you know, then you'd see the upper limit of it. Okay. But oftentimes there's so much clay you can't really see it. But it's all murky. Yeah, it gets real murky and it's really difficult sometimes to tell. But really visually it's just size of particles going from these very coarse to kind of medium fine sand sized particles and then the silt layer is smaller more packed together and then the clay is the very fine stuff sometimes even a different color okay. that will settle out yes i used a flashlight on one because it was hard to tell and uh, that that helped to reflect off some of the um sand oh, okay. quartz so that's something too to try interesting okay because yeah. it has the, the yeah. little mica in there yeah. sometimes yeah 
if the play is held in suspension for so long, how do you measure it? I think I really skewed the amount of clay I had because it was in suspension for okay. all that yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, um, I know, it's really difficult. One, one thing I have my students do sometimes is like when they get the soil first put in their jar, I have them make a mark. And we know that it never can go above that and really be settled. It, it always has to be below that mark. So we kind of use that as a benchmark. Say, if we're still looking at soil that's above that mark, then it's still floating and it hasn't really settled. Even though it looks like it's settled, it really should not be that tall because it physically there just isn't that much there. So, you know, we usually allow for a little bit of, you know, expansion, but not that much. So that helps just kind of keep it in balance. And then we, we just sort of budget after that. So I hate to say it, but unless you can really wait like three weeks and, you know, maybe come back and then kind of actually then it's totally settled. Well, if you, if you measure the sand and the silt, then would it, the remaining percentage just be clay? Correct, yeah. Yes. If, but you have to get the total settled soil to figure out what that percentage is based on. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I noticed that the soil at the bottom of my 18-inch hole is significantly different from the top. Okay. Does it matter where I'm... I ended up doing three or four jars, combinations, and from just the bottom and just the top. Okay. Um, and I'm also not confident that I've measured my layers correctly either. Okay. Um, but does it matter what... When, when someone's doing this, ideally to test, sure. you know, their soil, should they be doing a combination of the bottom clay-looking stuff and the topsoil, or...? Usually you want to concentrate on where the roots are growing. So depending on what you're growing and where they're actually... If they're in the top 12 inches, then that's probably all you need to, to do. the top 12 inches is 6 inches of one thing, or 8 inches of one thing, and 4 of another, you should combine them? Yeah, okay. yeah, we kind of do. So D it kind of depends on the plant. Yeah. So I noticed that, um, as you mentioned earlier, the organic matter's mm -hmm. on the top. Right. And so I'm assuming that that's neither sand nor clay nor silt. Correct, yeah. So we did our test theoretically on our yard soil. Mm -hmm. If I were to take soil from a planter bed, you know, that has... Mostly no, organic. Mostly organic, mm -hmm. then this test really wouldn't... Does not apply. apply. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's really only our native Correct. Soil. It only is for the native soil. Good point. Good point. So again, this is kind of looking at that. Okay, so great place to break right here. And uh, I think, what, you have 15 minutes? All right, so we'll see you back.